It don't matter how hot the girls are. If your music is lame, we can help with that, though. The Professional Adult Nightclub DJ Association presents Panda Off the Charts. Brand new tracks for the strip club industry to make your set sound fresher, more energized, and to keep things bumping. Here are your hosts, Danny Myers, Elon Fong, and Bob Chia Party. Panda Off the Charts, so what's hot in the strip clubs podcast on Pantheon Podcast Network. Bob Chiaparty has scored us another one of his outstanding, amazing guests here today. We have got a guy. He is the uh, the founding member, lead singer, and guitarist for the band Dope. Uh, and this is Edsel Dope with us here today. How are you, man? I'm good, buddy. Thanks for having me. Good to see all you guys and my old... Uh homeboy mr bob Shaparty up there yes, and his yes. <laughs> go back we go this is one of my favorite artists i've ever worked with my whole wow. 35 year career it's always a pleasure working with that so he's, what a what a wonderful thing super to talented say. he's he's just a businessman that you can rely on you notice he was on time when you know, we'd have to check <laughs> down or anything he's a pro he's a complete pro he was bragging about you uh when we were talking before you came on so he was telling us uh what a, what a class act you are in businessman and artist so Hey man, I'll take what I can get. Yeah, we're, <laughs> I'll we're gonna take get some. It. We're gonna get some Bob Edsel stories here in just a little bit. But first of all, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the band Dope, how do you describe the the Dope sound? And uh, how long have you been together? I don't even know when you formed. Uh, you know the sound is hard, and I, I don't want to get long winded with it. I just like to pe- normally. Pe- I'm just like it's loud. It's a loud <laughs> rock band. It's the easiest way. Um, but the band I got, I started the band in New York City in 1997. Um, I met Bob shortly after that because we were both New York City guys back then. Um, got signed to Epic Records in like '98, and then put out our debut album in '99. So we're we're coming up on our 25th anniversary of Ooh. being a national band, which definitely makes us old. Um, <laughs> yep, we are. Yeah. Classic rock at 25. <laughs> yeah, dude. Officially. It's, it's kind of crazy, but it's all good, man. I mean, the band's been around a long time. It's been it's been very good to me. Um, you know, we've uh, we've always been kind of this culty sort of thing that never really reached uh you know significant commercial success but we've always had like our little niche and uh it's you know it's cool i'm I'm very grateful to the relationship that uh that the band has with its fans and you know our it's weird some of our metrics are very interesting you know you can look at our spotify numbers which are significantly larger than a lot of bands that you would think are commercially more successful and viable than dope but for some reason we have this very loyal audience that just really sticks by us and and likes what we do. So I'm I, I don't know why, but I'll take it, and I'm I'm super grateful for that connection we have. Yeah, I, I think um, for I, the I, genre. I, go ahead, I was Bob. Just to say, I think I think for the genre that you're in, you guys make some you know amazing music, and I think you you're very clever with the choices you make on covers when you know when you the, the ones you do there and you just bring new life to them so familiar songs that sound fresh again um you you you've charted the the course of uh of dope in a very intelligent way and that's why you have the success you're great at what uh. you do but I was going to call it mediocre, but I, <laughs> but I, but, but that's why we've had this very level road, but, uh, but I'll take all that. I'll take any compliment. It's yeah. music is so subjective, man. It's so weird. And like, you know, it's also a, a lot of things that people don't really understand is, is, is how timing and, and I don't want to use the word luck because I don't want to take away from other people's success, but Man, timing and luck in this business are such important factors. I mean, you can you can have a record come out and, you know, there's so many politics that go into why a record could fail. Uh, there's so many little tiny, you know, the, the, the margins for error, especially back in the major label days, like you just missed that window and you your song is great, but somebody released a song three months before that's just filling that void to mm. humanity and your song could just miss the window because they're getting it. Like, it's just crazy. So anybody that's had any sort of a sustainable career in this industry should really count their lucky stars because it is so difficult. Um, and again, it is subjective. There is no right or wrong. Other than maybe some Beatles songs, there's no categorically <laughs> undeniable like great songs like mm. a song that 
somebody might have as their favorite song ever. You could pull a hundred people and they may all think it's a terrible song. So you just, you know, who knows, be grateful for the people that like you and like what you do and just, you know, be true to yourself and do what makes you happy and as best you can do. Well, you know, you have some some different sounds because I the first song that I think I ever really played a lot of yours in the strip club was back when we used to do Foxy Boxing. We would have two girls in the boxing ring and we needed music to play for a one minute bed while these girls are beating the crap out of each other. So can you imagine <laughs> which one of your songs we played? Die, motherfucker, die, motherfucker, die. <laughs> well, I mean, again, that's a, that's such a great a great example of of a blessing and a curse. So that song for us was uh, what you would normally call like the college radio track on our second major label album. Mm -hmm. Like that's the song you sort of lead with, but you know, it's not going to be a radio song, obviously, but you're just trying <laughs> to like go, here's our, here's our heavy presence of authority on album number two. Um, and we, we had so much heat coming off of our first album, uh, super, you know, super, uh, uh, aggressive, but melodic and commercial band Epic was behind it. And, uh, we released die motherfucker die as our metal track and, um, the world trade center fell down Oof. and Oops. we were on Epic records, which is Sony music. And I wasn't as evolved as I am now when it comes to just compromise and understanding some you know that there are factors that be that might be greater than my you know early 20s agenda of a bunch <laughs> of this right right um so long story short um that song is a big part and that that moment in time is a big part of why our second album came out and within three months of its release we were dropped from a major label and all of a sudden we were an independent band which was mm. Wow. Again, when you consider how successful our debut album was, that that's very unexpected. But in retrospect, you know, you can understand why Epic Records would not be about the die motherfucker life after the <laughs> World Trade Center. Yeah, yeah. But but long story short, um, at the time it was it was like, man, this 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 energy, this song, this moment in time has put the band on a a, a very less than favorable trajectory. But then here it is 20 plus years later, and the song has 100 million plays on Spotify, and it found its own audience without the help of the label and without the normal traditional marketing tools that go into marketing a band through the U.S. military and the fact that we were going to war with Iraq. You, you can't find a, a soldier that went to Iraq and say, hey, do you know who Dope and Die Motherfucker Die is? They're going to be like, yeah, dude, I learned to shoot a machine gun because you, they teach you to hold the trigger down to Die Motherfucker. Die Motherfucker. Wow. Because if you hold it too long, it'll burn out the barrel and it'll jam. So I, I have such a weird connection with soldiers and especially Marines that went and kicked doors down who were like, dude, without that song. And again, I'm sure those guys would have just done just fine with some other song in their ears, but they have this personal connection to me and to that song as their, uh, their war cry. And it's, you know, then the, you know, stories came out that they used our music to interrogate Iraqi yeah. POWs, hmm. like by, by putting them in, in, in dark rooms and just cranking up songs like yeah. die motherfucker died. And it's like, how did I get, become part of all of this you know so it Ooh. really is mind-blowing that like a song like that that was written from just a irresponsible ignorant like let's just throw a bunch of fucks and aggression into a song <laughs> and and in one way it cost me a massive relationship with a major label partner and at another time it created this entirely organic fan base for me of people that risk their life for our freedom and in one small way, I somehow uh, participated in our freedom. Like, again, no no credit here. I didn't do shit. But yeah. I, I somehow have this connection to these guys that fought and lost their friends fighting for our freedom. And, and somehow I've, I've, I've been able to be part of that. And I have this, like I said, very strange but warm connection with soldiers that um, just shows you the power of music. It's mm -hmm. fucking Amen. crazy. Go ahead. A Crazy. Lot. So Foxy Boxing to Machine Guns in Iraq. That's what that <laughs> song will do for you. Yes. Foxy Boxing. Alan? It's, it's probably a blessing insane. in disguise, man. I tell you what, there's no surprise to me. You have such a loyal following. You guys have played the Al Rosa Villa and 
Newport here in Columbus, Ohio, like every year, it feels like uh, I could never go because I worked weekends. I was working at the strip club. Uh, but you first came on my radar with your cover of You Spin Me Round, the Dead or Alive track, uh, which was it became a strip club staple, um, you know, looking for a cooler version of that song. And it's cooler than the original. You know what I mean? Well, and uh, that came from the American Psycho soundtrack. So like on and on and on, you guys have always played regularly there. And everyone I've talked to loves dope. I was like, oh, go on the dope show, go on the dope show, go on. The... And I always wanted to see, I just never could because I worked weekends. Um, so just took in Columbus, Ohio in and of itself and your, your, your status here and how respected you are in the metal community here. And I've heard how cool, what cool guys you are for years, for decades now, you know what I mean? Uh, it's no surprise that you have a career. So that's why, you know, there's a lot of people who are flashes in the pan. Yeah. They may make residuals off that one big hit single, but they can't even tour anymore. They can't play anymore. Sure. Right. You get to yeah. play and still live that dream. I, I assume you still like being on stage. You know what I mean? So that's debatable. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, touring can be tough. I get it. Being away from your, as you're older and right, you're more settled down, it's hard to be away sure. from, from family and friends and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, you have that career that a lot of people actually would kill or die for you. Everyone thinks they no would. No doubt. You know, only the 1% of the 1% become the mega stars of, you know, Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, blah, 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 sure. blah. Um, and yet you have carved out that high-end middle ground where you have a sustainable career which you, you don't have to work you know at a strip club you don't have to work at uh amazon or whatever you know what i mean so that, sure, that's cool sure. as fuck, bro and you still get to create and, and do cool stuff like this new song that we're going to talk about here in a minute the cover song yeah I, I, you you're 100 percent right and those are very very nice things to call out i appreciate that i i have two things that i'll i'll uh i'll give you from that one of them uh a very interesting story that not a lot of people know uh Columbus, Ohio is a place that we, especially when I was living in the Midwest in Chicago, uh, we would do a lot more um, weekend warrior touring because mm -hmm. the Midwest is super uh, accommodating for going out and playing Fridays and Saturdays in Midwestern markets. So that's one of the reasons that we were in Columbus as much as we were. But we were actually the last band to play the Alarosa Villa before Dimebag was murdered. Oh. Mm. We played there the night before, and mm. then um, and then we were the first band to go back and play it afterwards because wow. the the owner of the venue, Rick, Rick Catella, mm. uh, true story. Rick called me six months after Dimebag was murdered, and um, crying, going, "Edsel, nobody will play my club. Like yeah. I'm gonna go out of business, and I don't know what to do." And I said, "I said I'll play your club." He said, He's "Such a good dude." I, he, he goes, "I wasn't even calling to ask you to play my club. I was just calling to tell you that nobody will play it." I was like, "Dude, I know Dime would want us to play your club. Like he would want people to have that outlet because there wasn't a lot of places to play in Columbus unless you were at the Newport. So if you weren't big enough to play the Newport, like the Al Rosa was it. And when that happened, it it created such a a a gap." in those people's lives that were used to going and having that experience at the El Rosso. And of course there's, you know, all this taboo now around it for obvious reasons, but um, I, I didn't even hesitate. I, and, and it was amazing too, because we went back and we played a show it was sold out. And then Rick was like, dude, the floodgates opened. He's like, everybody was willing to come back again. They just didn't want to be first. And I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm I'm fine with it. So I uh I that was a very it was it was really a powerful little experience. But that was that's my Columbus, Ohio Al Rosa. Um but as far as that stupid dead or alive cover song you're talking about, <laughs> yeah, you, you can blame Bob Chapari for that one, dude. <laughs> I've been I've been blaming him for 20 freaking years. I gotta play that stupid ass song every single night. But I, I am grateful because people love it and it was really fun. And it definitely helps people to understand that even with the seriousness of the die motherfucker dies, we have a very <laughs> unserious party side to us that I think Bob recognized that. But the true story of how that went down, Bob calls me up and he goes, Hey Edsel, uh, have you heard of the 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 movie that's gonna be coming out uh called American Psycho? And I go, It's a book, right? He's like, Yeah, it's a book. It's this really cool, creepy, you know, culty book that they're turning into a movie. And of course, the movie's not out yet, so nobody knows if it's gonna be great, but all signs are pointing that this is gonna be a really great thing to be part of how would you like to be on the soundtrack david bowie's on the soundtrack new orders on the soundtrack the cures on the soundtrack and here's the thing Etzel, i've got you secured 
as the opening lead track, your track one on the soundtrack. And I go, <laughs> Bob, you're my hero. Yeah, of course I want to do this. And, and he goes, but there's a catch. Uh, <laughs> He's going to reel you in. <laughs> I, I go, what's the catch? He's like, I really need you to re-record this song, Spin Me by Dead or Alive. And I went, oh, you son of a bitch. I said, how much does it pay? <laughs> and he had a he had a he had a favorable number and i was like okay i guess we're doing it so truthfully we went right in the studio we actually recorded it while we were on tour and um uh, and it came out really cool and, and it, it 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 wasn't on the original pressing of the dope's debut album because it, it it was done during our touring cycle but it was so successful for us that they ended up stripping it on to the later pressings of the record and it's become you know, one of our most popular songs and uh, it's it's quite silly. And I, every night that we play it on stage, I use it as an opportunity to literally tell the crowd like, you know, nobody came here to be serious tonight. Right. Because we're going to play you the stupidest song you have ever heard in your entire life. And dude. And it's another one of those things that just shows you how music transcends. We we uh, we played with Slayer mm -hmm. one time. And I remember specifically standing backstage and Slayer's guitar tech, some big burly dude with man tits and a beard. And he's <laughs> like, hey, man, you're not going to play that You Spin Me Round song tonight, are you? Because those fucking Slayer fans will tear you apart. And I go, bro, I'm going to play that stupid fucking song. And you stand right there and watch while those fucking Slayer fans, those big moshing crazy bastards are going to take they're going to take their shirts off and they're going to spin them around their head <laughs> and and they're going to sing you spin me round he goes it'll never happen brother dude 15 <laughs> minutes later every balding big crazy slayer fan had their shirts off, swinging them around. Because, of course, awesome. I told them to. I was, Let's get our shirts off and, and swing them <laughs> yeah. around. And the, dude, and 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 again, Dope is out there playing with Slayer. And half the crowd is singing You Spin Me Around like a record before they hear, you know, freaking. Uh, uh, rain and blood. Uh, rain and blood. <laughs> rain and blood. I was wait and bleed kept coming. I was like, no, that's Slipknot. Rain and blood. <laughs> well. So, you know, yeah, we and we toured with Slipknot a lot too, and and played that song too. That song that is sense. undeniable. Everyone loves it, as horrible as it is. So thank you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, You're most welcome. Right <laughs> well, we're yeah. we're going to talk about your new stuff here in just a second, but I want to get Bob Chiaparty's take. Bob Chiaparty, stripjointsmusic dot com. I want to get your take on that exact story. Did it happen exactly like he said? <laughs> he, he's pretty much nailed it on the head. That that really was it. That was really. I cannot tell a lie, man. No, not only. I tell me what I'm telling lies. At one time, I uh, Etzel was playing New York, right? And I, I brought a brand new date. First time I ever brought this girl, right? Uh, cute little, sweet thing, right? And uh, uh, and uh -oh. she and she comes in, and uh. we we go to the show, and at, at Etzel gets into that whole tells the whole story before the thing, and he. Points down at me. I got very late that night. Let's put it down. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Good job, that's all. Helping a brother out. The perfect wing. Oh, man. good to hear. I, I I remember that too, Bob. Yeah, I always love it when Bob makes an appearance at uh, at a at a dope show, man. Um, it's it's good times. It really brings you back to the roots because New York was different back then, man. Like it was the like the. The best times of my career, honestly, were before my fucking album came out because we ran New York City. We were like uh -huh. the most popular unsigned band in New York that then got signed. And uh, and we just I don't know, man, there was something about New York City in 1996, 97, 98, 99 that it was just the coolest place to be. And we had, uh, you know, we had we had season passes to any nightclub we wanted to go to. We always had a pocket full of kryptonite. We always had, you know, the hottest <laughs> girls. Like it was, it was a crazy time. And man, I, I really look back at those and, and maybe it was the ignorance and ignorance is bliss, but dude, like I had more fun and felt more on top of the world, just kicking around New York city and riding the subways at two o'clock in the morning than I ever did um, after the fact. But so yeah, Bob and a small clique of dudes that we had that were all kind of on the dope train super early 
um it was a great 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 time really reminds me of mm. that community that we had and and Bob was a pioneer, dude. Bob, like concrete marketing back then was like, you couldn't put out a record and and think you were going to have a shot if Bob wasn't in and Bob's team Bob. weren't working that record right. and like, you know, giving it a thumbs up. Like you were, you weren't even, you weren't even invited to the treehouse. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So he, awesome. he, he had his, uh, he had a, his thing. And again, it was all super organic and, they didn't feel corporate at all, which is crazy to think because it was a very corporate machine back then. But mm -hmm. our little click, there was there was nothing corporate about it. There was nothing fake or 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 uh, or uh, you know packaged or you know what's the word I'm looking for that that just like <laughs> homogenized like none of that existed for us and for our little team. It was just we were just on fire and it was just out of control debauchery stupidity <laughs> and it was so much fun and bob was right there in the middle of it and and dare i say responsible for a lot of it because we were all just working hard together and and uh and, and just committed to each other as friends and it was awesome man it's great to know bob 25 years later and be doing something like this telling stories from 1997 it's like what is happening it's uh, crazy that's fun. awesome well, I want to talk a little Crazy. bit about the newer stuff. Um, you've got an album that just came out uh, earlier this year. Uh, we heard the first song that uh, Bob brought us uh, a few months ago, which was Fuck It mm -hmm. Up. Great song. Worked well for me in the strip clubs. And then Bob told me that uh, you've got, uh, you did a cover of Love Song, the Cure Song, Love Song. And I said, wait, I, I just can't picture Love Song being in this heavy metal rah 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 kind of feel so then i listen to it and it's not it's it's a very very cool and in my opinion and I'll, I'll play the song here and let everybody else give their thoughts but in my opinion uh this cover of, of love song that you guys did is without a doubt the best strip club song song that for a strip club by dope ever in my opinion oh, sweet. so i think it's going to work really really well but i want to play about 30 seconds of it and then we'll go back and uh, and talk about it so here's 30 seconds of dope with love song Had a little, let a little bit of that electronic part get in there. I'm, a, as I said, I think it for the strip club is the best oh, yeah. song I've heard. It's gonna, sh it's gonna shake some asses for sure, dude. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mixed well. I can hear it in these headphones that it's gonna um, do what I like to call shake the drinks off the tables. Um, so it is, it's definitely one to crank up and I can see, um, I can see a high energy rock girl just spinning around that pole quicker than hell. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, that's my thought on it. Let me go to, uh, to Alon Fong here up in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, man. I, first of all, the original has always been a popular request, but the original is too slow, right? So for most clubs, uh, 311 did a, famously did a cover of it, but it's pretty true to the original. Mm. Um, I know I played a remix of it. Did, did Deftones cover that one? I can't remember. I don't think so. Maybe it wasn't Deftones. Anyways, but I love that because you made it upbeat. Uh, I love all the electronic flourishes too uh, in the beginning and in the verses. Uh, it's gotten more bump by far than the original. So yeah, for clubbing, your vocals sound great too as a singer and man, I uh, love your voice on it. Uh, it's a huge classic song. I know ladies love it. You know, it's it's love song. It's been that way forever. Uh, the original is a great song, and you made it your own, which is really hard to do with a signature track like that. So I love yeah. hearing that you put your the dope spin on it, and I hope you don't end up hating this song like you do uh, or being uncomfortable <laughs> with the song like Spin Me Round because I have a no, feeling you've got it's... another Spin Me Round in your hand. It's a little different because Spin Me Around is just so mindless, you know, like yeah. Love Song, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to do it is just because I don't think anybody with a soul that grew up in the time frames we all grew up in heard that song and didn't like almost get choked up. Like there's just something so real and human about that song. And I don't care if it's love that's lost or love mm -hmm. that you still have 
or love to a significant other or to a family member. Like it doesn't matter. Like love is the most powerful thing we all know on the planet. It makes you do the craziest things and, and, and the most amazing things. So um, I just really wanted to express that energy. Um, and uh, it's funny because I, I hear people describe it similarly to how both of you guys did which is actually the opposite of what's happening. If you listen to the original love song, the tempo is it's way faster. It's an up tempo song. I took it the other way. I did it halftime and made it more of a droney, almost like I hate to use the comparison because I've had it since my entire career, but it's all good because he's a fucking genius, but it's got more of a Marilyn Manson-y kind of like downplayed, you know, darker tone to it. Um, whereas the cures was up tempo and, and poppy and very uplifting. I kind of took it the other direction where I wanted it to make you sad as opposed to the original love song that Robert Smith wrote as a wedding gift to his wife. It's supposed to right. make you feel up. It's, I look at it like he's releasing the white, you know, white doves into the air. Whereas like I'm singing that song with a black pigeon on my shoulder. <laughs> you know? it, it's I took it to the darker places where I feel like it, it it rips your heart out. Whereas Robert Smith wrote it to like open your heart up. And, and, and uh, that's, that was my take on it. It's, I think it's very depressing, but I, I, <laughs> it's I, definitely it's, darker, but there's, yeah, energy but it's one of the, it. one of the coolest things I, I feel like we've done in a while. And it, and um, I, I hope people like it. The video is really dark and cool as well, but cool. You know, finding an audience is is always interesting. You know, we'll see what it does. I have very nominal expectations. I don't expect it to change my life, but I, the people that find it, I hope they like it and hope it serves a purpose. Well. And I think it will definitely work in the in the in the strip clubs, though, just because of the tempo and the vibe. And a lot of strippers are damaged too, so they'll they'll probably Amen. enjoy the the dark <laughs> the darkness Absolutely. of it. Yeah. Well, it's great, good. great cover, man. Phenomenal yeah. job. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's going to hit all the different ages too, because you yeah. know, yeah, the older people are going to hear it and say, hey, "I remember that song," and the newer people are going to say, "Oh, new song," you know? Sure. Oh, you mean that was a cover? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's it's so. it's funny. I uh, I have a 16 year old stepson who uh, I put in the music video. Um, oh, cool. Again, video is really dark and and um and he uh, i go hey dude i need you to do this thing he's like what am i doing i said just he's a really good looking young kid you know he's and i was like just put on some makeup and show up and i'll i'll, I'll show you what <laughs> you're gonna do you're gonna be in this burned down house and there's this whole thing going on he's like okay i never acted before so he just kind of shows up and and then we we cut the video and he's like man this is a really cool song dude like i didn't know you had it in you because you know he's a 16 year old <laughs> doesn't like any of my shit because it's all old <laughs> and, uh, and I go, and I go, I go, you don't know that song. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, bro, that's the, that's like one of the most popular songs ever. And he's like, well, I don't know. Like, he had no idea that it was a cover song. It was yeah. just yeah. crazy. But, that's yeah. great. That's great. Well, you know, we're going to try to get this out to all the strip club DJs and strip club DJs. Sweet. We want you to listen to it, play it and chart it on your uh, chart that you send into Elon. So we can see this thing, hopefully get on the, on the Panda top 20 chart that we put out every month. Elon and I also do another podcast uh, uh, about every other month or so. We're doing a, a series now on rock covers. So I promise you, I promise you this will be on our next Rock Covers podcast, <laughs> which is probably, I don't know, we're probably about three weeks away from recording the next one of those. So uh, so very, very cool. Um, so people can follow you and find you. Uh, where uh, You're a social media guy, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I not by choice. I like <laughs> That's one of the places where I feel like I do kind of fail because I, you know, when I was 20 years old and I was starting this whole thing, I absolutely shared the narcissism that young people have. Like, you know, a lot of the reasons <laughs> that we get into rock and roll, we want attention and we want to add, you know, affirmation, but um, man, I'm a old ass man and I have no interest in sharing with the world. Like, Hey, this is what I'm eating today. And like, You're I just right. don't think I'm that important. And I think uh, in a way it, it, it works counterproductively to me because people that do let you behind the curtain and share their life as, as, as if it's important, you know, that's people are interested in that shit, but I'm terrible at it. But if you want to find me, um, you can find us pretty much across the board. It's just dope. The band 
So like dope, dope the band.com band. or Instagram, dope the band, face, Facebook, dope the band. It's all just dope the band. Cause that seemed to be the easiest moniker for it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not that hard to find. It's the only thing that, it, again, I've noticed more and more, um, with YouTube and, and the Zuckerberg apps, um, we definitely get throttled, man. Like our, our YouTube, like, or our Facebook, even if you log into Facebook and try to find dope, you'll get a warning. It says the site you are trying to access may have something to do with the sale or consumption of illegal uh, narcotics. And wow, it's like, God. so, so like, you know, uh, something you may or may not know about me. I'm also the manager of the band. And uh, I also manage uh, one of our really good friend and contemporary bands that has had a big resurgence over the last few years called Static X. Oh, wow. Um, so because I handle all the business for both Dope and Static X, um, I feel like it, I can see the obvious places where this happens. So YouTube, for instance, Dope and Static X, surprisingly, even though Static X is a much bigger band, we have about the same number of subscribers on our YouTube channels. But when I release something on Static X's YouTube channel, the amount of interactions that I'll sure. get compared to when I release something on the Dope YouTube channel, it's mind-bogglingly di different. Yeah. And again, I'll give Static X the credit for being a bigger, more successful band. And that means that they should have more interactions. But the disparity is so big that yeah. I'm I'm unquestionably convinced that YouTube has just selected the word dope and right. says this is, gets throttled and we yeah. we limit the reach of it. And I know it happens with our Facebook, too. So it's one of those those weird things where, again, you don't you we don't have a crystal ball and just like die motherfucker die was like this blessing and a curse for the band. The name has been the same thing. It's like, it's such a cool word and such a cool thing to come out of 1999 being the band dope, but the longevity of it, like there's a lot of places where we, we, you know, for example, with the amount of connection that we have to the U S military, wouldn't you think that dope would have played a USO show by now? Yeah, but it will never happen. I think so. It will it yeah. will never happen because the US military will never be able to promote that dope right. is coming to play our base. Right. But they'll bring Drowning Pool and they'll bring Saliva and they'll bring all these other bands, but we'll never get the call. So if had we became a commercial band, would we have ever played an NBA halftime show? Like I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's, there's definitely been some things that I've seen, you know, as I've looked at the business side of it, where the name has, has uh, been a bit of an issue, but now more than ever with, with uh, the throttling or the censorship, however you want to put it yeah. with social media and, and, and good old Zuckerberg, who seems to have this tendency to uh, lean in one particular direction. We, we definitely, I think, catch some, uh, I don't even want to call it friendly fire. We catch some fire that uh, sort of stops us from reaching as many people as we would. Now, but, you know, the places, the metric that you can't control or manipulate is Spotify, which is where I just right. always just sit back and go like, well, there's how you can tell what our audience is because mm -hmm. they can't throttle that one. Right. So, uh, so yeah, uh, but that's how you find us, Dope the Band. Um, but if we post, you may not see it. <laughs> yeah, just makes me you think. Gotta, you got to find us. That old commercial. Yeah. Why do you think they call it dope? <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh man. It's been it's been a pleasure having you on. Alon, do you have final thoughts here before we uh kind of shut it shut it shut it down? Yeah, man. First of all, shout out to uh Rick Catella, the rock and roll Revan. The Arosa is no longer around. I don't know if you know that. He sold it. I do. Uh and retired, which is sad. So I don't know where you're playing Columbus, but you got any tour dates coming up with this stuff going on? Um, yeah, we've been, uh, you know, because of my relationship with the Static X guys and uh, and the relationship that we've had for 25 years now, um, I've been able to position dope in uh, a lot of the Static X um, celebration. So we've done a lot of touring with Static X back in the day, a lot of the touring with Static X since they re uh, regrouped and awesome. we are touring this fall. Uh, the bill is actually really amazing. It's Static X7 Dust and Dope. Wow. Um, Damn. Yeah, that's a sick, sick tour. I don't know. I don't think it's coming to Columbus on this leg because uh, Seven Dust is out with Alter Bridge playing a lot of markets that we can't go to. But we're talking about doing additional legs of the tour uh, in early 2024. That would put us there. But um, 
I think nowadays it's like the Newport, and then there's another room that is is actually pretty cool that I, that we just played recently called the King of Clubs. King Clubs, yeah, yeah. I'm going to yeah, my first show there to see King's X here in about a month. So yeah, it's 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 a cool room. Um, they got a lot of things right. Um, a couple okay. things, you know, a couple things they could look at probably a little differently. Um, but but it's it's a cool room. I think people will be happy with that one as as you know the Al Rosa replacement. Cool, mm, cool. Very good. DJs, chart this song, play this yeah. song. Entertainers, especially the ones that get to pick your own music, man, make sure you go up to, uh, and tell your DJ he's got to download. It's on Spotify, as he says, right there. You got to get that love song. A lot of other ones he also, hey, uh, Fuck It Up was, like I say, one that Bob brought to us, um, I don't know, about three months ago. Uh, check out the whole album. It's a pleasure having you on. And when I do see your concert tour come close to uh, – Ohio somewhere. Uh, I'm going to be calling Bob and saying, "Hey, give him a call, man. I want to. I want to meet him in person." Yeah, we'll come. Yeah, we'll no come problem, dude. Yeah, yeah anytime. Yeah. We we usually play the. You know, Cleveland is always a staple for us. Columbus generally, like the. You know, Ohio has always been really good to us. So we 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 always try to fit that place in when we can. Okay. Well, I'm Cincinnati on the lower side. A lot oh, of nice. Yeah, we we were at Bogarts just a few months oh, ago. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. Oh, man, I missed that. You that missed it. It was sold out, baby. Sold out. Yeah. Shit. Uh, one yeah, little final thing. I didn't know you guys did uh, Vince McMahon's theme song. That's fun, cool as hell. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, a, a cool, a cool story to that was, um, you know, those theme songs were always a bit goofy. And yeah. uh, the way that the way they did them back in the day is they had this dude that essentially kind of wrote them all because mm -hmm. they wanted to retain all the publishing. Johnson. Johnson. What was his name again? Yeah, he, J Jim Johnson. Jim he's not Johnson. there anymore. Yeah, he's, yeah, gone, yeah. He's, he's not there anymore, but um, but he was kind of like their in-house dude who wrote it all so that all the publishing could remain at uh, at WWE. And right. I don't know how it happened, but um, so they sent us the original version of of Mr. McMahon's theme, and it was like a rap thing. And, it, and I was like, how am I going to do this? And... Uh, and and the mix ended up not being great in retrospect, but I really like what we did with the song. And 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 it was so it was such a departure from the original demo that Jim Johnson had written that I right. actually got some publishing for that song. Like they actually and I mean, I probably wrote 80 percent of probably more than that, honestly. But yeah. in, generally, even if you do that with WW, it's like, well, thanks for your contributions, but you get zero publishing. Right, right. But for some reason on that one, I changed it so much. And I guess they liked the end result that I was actually able to negotiate a little bit of publishing in that one. Nice. But I, I, I really like it. I don't think he used it for very long, but I, I thought it was clever. Like I, I, I put this hook in where it was like, this is my world. And in my world, like I'll break your face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was perfect for McMahon. And I was like, I, sure. I, I really, I really, really happy that we got to do that. And fuck, we got to do McMahon steam. We didn't do a yeah, wrestler right? steam. We did the right. guy steam. The, the fucking the Tony Soprano. <laughs> so, um, so I, I thought that was another nice little Easter egg that you know a lot of people don't know about us. And it's yep. always very fun, cool, so. man. Yeah, man. Awesome, awesome. Ansel, dope. From the band Dope, we thank you so much for coming on. Well, I appreciate you guys' time. Nice to meet you, fellas. And as always, Bob, I, I love you to death, and you're the best. And love thanks you, for bro. always thinking of me. And I get to see Bob in person on uh, tomorrow morning, actually. I was, oh, nice. I was just, te Fine. just telling my wife, I'm like, I got to go do this thing, and then I got to run some errands, and I got to wake up early as shit tomorrow because I got to fight L.A. <laughs> traffic to get down and uh, and meet my my buddy Bob for some bacon and eggs. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Great guys, you. man. Thanks for listening to Panda Off the Charts. Presented by the Professional Adult Nightclub DJ Association. Now you know what's new. Get a full list of tracks from this show and previous shows at pandaoffthecharts.com.